So I'm um, Dr. Jennifer Donnelly. I'm a consultant obstetrician working in the Rotunda Hospital and also the Mater Hospital. I um, the area that I work in is uh, maternal fetal medicine. So basically, all of my job is working with women um, uh, and women's healthcare, and be that pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, or after pregnancy. Um, women who are sick in pregnancy, women who are well, um, and so informing women about how conditions are going to affect their pregnancy, discussing their concerns in relation to that is really the central part of my job. Um, also, from a, um, a teaching and education component, I have research into uh, medical conditions in pregnancy, also how disability can affect pregnancy, um, as well as advocating for access to services for women in pregnancy. Yeah, so um, Debunking the Myths was a HR, is a HRB funded programme uh, which was a real pleasure to be part of, I have to say I really, really have enjoyed being a part of it. And so the aim of that was to, to, to address some of the myths that arise in healthcare, for example in relation to HPV vaccination for cervical cancer, for addressing how the component that I mainly dealt with was women's bodies and what we called our bodies, how we label them, how others label them, how we saw ourselves in relation to that and how that can affect healthcare, contraception, fertility and it was a workshop based and so we, had, we did it um, over 2018, 2019, we were just about to launch it in 2020 when coronavirus hit but over the course of the of the program that we had that we delivered, we had a number of schools, both um, boys and girls schools, mixed and single sex schools came and had a morning session with speakers who had expertise in all the various different areas and presented some of um, some work on that evidence-based information to try and bust some of the myths in relation to uh, those topics that I've addressed as well as then opening the floor to questions and so we it was quite interactive the sessions which was great that all of the students were able to bring their mobile phones with them which I think they were delighted about and then they could ask questions anonymously that we could address that maybe they might have been embarrassed to ask um, if they had to put their hand up. So my main focus of the talk was debunking myths about the vagina and really that was about talking about our bodies and not being ashamed about talking about our bodies and also addressing what we call our bodies and in fact over the last number of years I think in the media there's been a huge uh, and in just kind of a general cultural awareness and an ability to talk about stuff like our vaginas and vulvas that maybe you know even five or ten years ago really would not be the topic of mainstream conversation. I think there's a lot I think now young women, teenagers are more open about talking about sexuality, but even though they may be more open about talking about parts of their body, it may, they may not be comfortable talking about them and they may, there still can be shame around those things, but maybe dealt with in a different way. And so I tried to address some of that. For example, one of the things was, um, what do we call ourselves? So many people will call their vulva, their external genitalia, their vagina, whereas actually the vagina is the internal part of our um, of our anatomy as opposed to the external part and there's so many different words that can be used in a slang term for the vulva and vagina and sometimes that can cause shame. I think uh, some young women are reclaiming that and are more comfortable talking about it but even still particularly now there's such a high prevalence of for young people to have access to porn so what's normal what does a normal vulva look like has maybe been distorted by that so part of the talks were addressing that um, and being comfortable with such a wide range of normal. We can see that um, there's been an increase in young women attending their GPs and textual health clinics and gynecologists looking for um, cosmetic labiaplasty or cosmetic surgery of their, their labia, their ex the external lips of their vulva because they feel uncomfortable with that because maybe they don't meet up to some norm that they may feel is a norm but in fact is, is definitely not and that's definitely become more prevalent over the last 10 years and so to say that there is a huge range of normal and there's a lot of good resources out there uh, Brits Bag for example which is the British Society for uh, Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology has an excellent booklet and the Australia there's a great Australian booklet on that as well and then in just more kind of general mainstream um, literature there's a great book by Laura Bates and um, called Girl Up, which has got a fantastic uh, number of chapters on talking about your body, and um, so that's a really great source of information. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think certainly over the last number of years, we've seen a huge change in um, the discussion around abortion health care. And that obviously with repeal of the Eighth Amendment in 2018, it really brought a huge conversation into the public domain. And given the fact that there was an overwhelming majority in favour of providing abortion health care for women in Ireland, I think that's been a massive shift, a massive cultural shift, and actually a massive shift in, in terms of embarrassment about talking about it uh, and also about accessing it because we know so many women were traveling to the UK or accessing medications online that were on um, uh, that were unregulated that were and they were maybe ashamed to come to the hospital and ask for help or to even admit that they had taken pills online because they didn't know they could were they going to be criminalized and now that we've had the eighth, the eighth Amendment has been repealed. There's been a huge amount of more conversation in relation to abortion, contraception, and sexual health, um, and that people perhaps are now more likely to access care in relation to that, and which is really great to see over a period of time. And I think as an obstetrician, certainly, you know, having worked in the area for 20 years, I've you know, become very comfortable talking about it, but it's not an easy subject for many people to talk about because it is relatively new. And we, I've certainly seen that with other colleagues um, in other specialties, may not be as familiar with the terminology, may, not, may be uncertain about how to address this. But I think because there was such huge public discussion, it really facilitated a conversation about that. But that's an ongoing um, issue. It's still, there's still stigma associated with it. And so that, or because of and many GPs, because a lot of the provision of abortion healthcare has fallen to GPs within the first um, trimester, and they have some of them, a huge group of them, have taken it on and really addressed it. But there may be shame in certain areas around the country where there is only one GP providing it, or if they have to travel a long distance of time. So that's still a major issue that's particularly affecting younger women, um, and I think that's something that we need to continue to talk about and highlight and advocate for. Um, and that's something that I would come across in my work on a regular basis. So I think we can tackle them by talking about them. So talking about them in many different arenas, talking about them in school, talking about them as part of medical training so that people who are in all walks of healthcare are aware of um, of their implicit biases in, in dis, uh, discussing women's health care. We know from there's been a lot of work that um, women's perception of pain can sometimes be underestimated and that with, uh, for example, if you look at, which is totally outside of my area of expertise, but heart attack pain, that people, women, men presenting with pain in relation to heart attacks are more likely to be taken seriously than women. Also, the classic um, type of chest pain may not be the cl that may be classic in men but may not be as classic as women we can see that women who are coming from underrepresented communities and um, black Asian ethnic other minority ethnic groups are also less likely to have their health concerns taken seriously and we can see that in the increased morbidity and mortality in pre pregnancy related or in those groups of women in in groups of women in Ireland and the UK and in the US and worldwide so that's something that we still need to address so first of all to find a, tr a trusted person so I think a GP is a really good first port of call and I mean I suppose the method of communication um, or is has changed over time and I think that young younger people teenagers are sometimes more comfortable talk using remote methods or virtual methods than maybe older people are and that's actually something that may facilitate access to healthcare certainly we found that in a debunking myths the people were much more willing to ask the awkward question um, electronically rather than having to stand up and say it. So maybe facilitating those kind of conversations can be helpful and I suppose COVID has maybe accelerated um, our access to that and I think that that's something that we should be looking at more um, for early access but always talking to a trusted adult, be that a teacher, a, a GP, an older sister, an aunt um, and to other friends that they can have support with and to not be, uh, and also then that they meet the right person. So as healthcare professionals, that we are open to listening to what people have to say, to be aware of our own implicit biases when it comes to listening to people when they're coming to us with particular concerns and to not dismiss concerns that may seem minor. So listening and reflecting back what people have said is very important in terms of open communication.